Burns. Burns. It's a touchy subject because we all think of patients with burns. We were just <sighs> talking before we started about how patients with burns are so memorable in the sense that it's a smell, it's an experience, it's a, you know, it's a very painful thing to see people with bad burns. But we see lots of minor burns too. So it's a very common thing. So what do we need to know for the test? Well, remember that you can divide people's body surface area. You need to know how much of their body surface area is burned. And so to estimate that, remember the rule of nines, that you can divide up the parts of the body into approximate nine percent of their, I always thought this was an interesting rule. I don't, you know, how exactly they picked nine percent, but it actually is pretty it's good. Interesting. It's pretty good. <laughs> it works. It definitely works. Everyone's bought into it. I like how they highlight the little penis as one percent. That's very interesting. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, okay. So the rule of nines is important. Now kids also have a similar yeah. estimation chart, but theirs is a little bit different, and it makes sense because when they're real little guys, their head is quite big, and so it represents a more of a big percentage, and their head just gets smaller over time. You see in their little, it looks like a little swimsuit that they're on that kind of goes up. And so their numbers adjust as they get bigger. So this is something I don't think you need to memorize. You could always look mm. it up if you needed to. Right. Um, and then the poor little baby babies, if this happens to be the case, look how big, that's 21% their head and their neck. It's a huge part of their area. Um, and their legs are, you know, it's just their, their proportions are different. So right. just know They're that just the a big head with a, with exactly. the, like a little potato head person. The charts yeah. reflect the changes in size as they get older. The, one of the important parts of burns is obviously the fluid resuscitation. And they're gonna they've now lost their outer lining, and so they're going to lose lots and lots of fluids. We know that that's a big part of it. And so the ATLS recommendations at this time are basically following this formula. Remember that we give people with burns yeah. LR because they're getting very large volumes of, of fluid. And if they have over 20% of their body surface area with deep partial and full thickness burns, not the not the superficial burns, but you count the second, basically the second and third degree burns is what you count when you're estimating body surface area, then you can go ahead and make this, this calculation. And it's a weight-based formula. So for adults, it's two cc's times their weight in kilos times their percent body surface area per day of LR. And you're going to give half of that in the first eight hours. So it's a big dose, a big volume up front. And then it kind of goes in over the next 16 hours. And it's a little higher for kids, three cc's per kilo, which makes sense. They've it got, does. They have more, they're juicier, we already said. So they yes. need, that's how I think of it. They need a little bit more fluid. Right. right. And if it's an electric burn that even goes up a little higher because maintaining urine output as their muscles have melted and they're going into rhabdo right. is an important thing to keep their urine output very high and that is really the ultimate goal is to keep that urine flowing as mm -hmm. the body is processing all of the breakdown of the tissue which is why you follow inside. that right That's you look exactly at that right. make sure that Foley bag still gets pretty full you know that you're watching that fluid come out yeah it and this by the way is is uh, if you if you remember the Parkland formula right. this is not the same anymore that's right so get rid of the Parkland formula in your brain because that would they it's basically half yeah the partial formula it's, it's less. less and the lr is because you don't want to if you use normal saline you would cause a hyperchloremic acidosis with the volumes you need of this so lr gives you the less of a chance of doing that remember that lr is incompatible with blood transfusion so right. if it happens to be a trauma since we're in the trauma module you can't use lr if you're transfusing blood right now, one of the things that comes up with burns is when to send somebody for a burn center. And this is hard to test because there are some yeah. variations, uh, but there are certain things that are just uniform, um, like people who have hand burns, especially across the flexor surface of the hands, genital burns, facial burns. The more body surface area, the more likely you are to send them to a burn center. Um, third degree burns need to go to a burn center. Anything is a true inhalational injury. A lot of these make sense. Circumferential burns need to go to a burn center. So these criteria, although variable from burn center to burn center, have certain themes that are uniform. And if they were to test you on this, as far as a burn center being an option for a question answer, they're going to give you a very clear cut case of somebody who really shouldn't stay where they are and should go to a specific burn center. Now, one of the things we worry about with burn complications is inhalational lung injury. So we, and that's one of the reasons you ask, like, what were the circumstances of the burn? Was the person outside where there was lots of, you know, ventilation or were they in an in-trap space where they may have ended up inhaling hot, sort of contaminated air where they may have had a, an inhalational lung injury, anything from burns to toxicity from whatever it is that's actually burning, like cyanide toxicity, carbon, carbon um, monoxide poisoning. And we know that some of the toxins will cause ARDS flat out up front. They just cause ARDS. Um, pulmonary infections are way later. That is not an early thing by any stretch, but we definitely can have a relatively early inhalational lung injuries, which is one of the reasons we have a low threshold to intubate certain cases especially when there's airway burns directly or there's a significant potential toxin inhal inhalation. 
the, the scenario is going to determine the risk. Again, ask about enclosed spaces or not. And our, our threshold to intubate, especially if you're transferring somebody, should be low. So you're, you're almost never wrong to intubate someone where you're concerned and can say, here was what was burned, here was what they were exposed to, and they're going far away. You're, it's completely fine to go ahead and intubate that person. It, and actually, at ABEM general, odds yeah. are you're going to need to intubate. Yeah. That needs to be sort of a decision that you make. Now, another thing that ABEM general may have you do, um, it's kind of parallel to the idea of doing a perimortem C-section or a resuscitative, you know, basically hysterotomy, a hysterotomy opening a hole in the uterus. It's the same idea. You may have never done an escher in a burn patient in your career. But it is something that ABEM General is going to expect you to feel quite comfortable doing in the right situation. The whole point of an escherotomy is that you have a third degree burn. It's basically turned skin to leather around something where distally something is compromised. So if it's, a, if it's, a, it's an arm or a leg, you have neurovascular compromise. You're squishing on the vessels, you're squishing on the nerves. So if they have a neurovascular compromise. If it's the chest or the torso where the whole torso is involved, where they can't breathe now because it's like having a corset on, that needs to be relieved. And what they'll give you in a clinical scenario is somebody who has, for instance, a respiratory acidosis. They can't ventilate very well because they just can't. And somebody who has plethora of the head because they have a circumferential neck burn where they have third degree all around the neck, it's like strangled what they're going to expect you to do is to open that and it's like cutting a, an overcooked hot dog you basically cut skin that is insensate it's third degree and you pop it open so you get stay away from big structures are important stay away from vessels etc but go ahead and most chest escherotomies are recommended to be done in an h basically down the sides and across the middle to pop that thing open same thing when it comes to legs or arms just cut it usually longitudinally through both all the aspects of that third degree burn again abem general is going to expect you to feel comfortable doing this and just know the indications to do it. Yeah, absolutely. Now, what about chemical injuries? Now, remember, there's acid injuries and there's alkali injuries, and they have different patterns. So al acid, a acid injuries cause a coagulation necrosis, and I like the analogy to ceviche, ceviche. that you put something acidic on those proteins, and the it proteins coagulate. They took, and it so cooks. that's really what acids do, versus alkali that liquefy, yeah. liquefaction necrosis. This happens at home. This happens at work. People get these chemicals on their skin, and, you know, it could be, having, it could be intentional. Somebody throws something something on somebody like an assault. Um, it could also be an ingestion. It could also be, you know, these are often occupational, but knowing what, what do we do? Well, when it comes to chemical injuries, whether it's the eyes or the skin, is that we irrigate. We try to wash things yeah. out, get the pH back to normal as best we can. And if they've ingested it, we don't want them to vomit it back up and re-expose everything to the chemical. We want to just, you know, see what happens. And they may need scopes to look and see what kind of damage was done, et cetera. In these types of cases, you may check basic labs. You may think about calcium in terms of of the um, chelation that can happen, their CK may be involved, their coagulations, and we're going to give them supportive care and give them pain control, et cetera. Now, there is a specific chemical injury we have to know a specific antidote to, and yeah. that's hydrofluoric acid. And they love to test on hydrofluoric they do. acid. Oh it's my actually goodness. a really interesting thing to see. We yeah. actually see quite a bit of this where I work because yeah. we're near the refineries, uh -huh. but it's... It's really interesting. So this is an acid that you can use in glass etching or many, many different industrial settings. And it's very interesting because it can really get down deep and do a lot of damage underneath, but where on the outside, you don't see a whole lot. It actually doesn't usually look like this picture. Yeah. It usually looks like a normal hand. Yeah, interesting, right? And then it can bind the calcium and cause systemic hypocalcemia. And it can be like, you don't see a whole lot on the outside, but it really hurts on the inside. And that's sort of the typical mm -hmm. exam. And so we treat this with calcium gluconate, not calcium calcium chloride, but calcium gluconate. And you can put gel on there. You can also infiltrate it. You can even give it classically or intra-arterially, although I've never seen that done, but you could do that. Um, and that will help bind the fluoride yeah. up. Just like the fluoride binds the calcium, you can lower your calcium. You're going to use yeah. the calcium to suck it give up. Give it extra calcium exactly to do it right. instead. Yeah. Remember that calcium chloride is very tissue toxic and it can, if it, you know, extravasates, it's bad news. So don't use yeah, calcium chloride. That's why chloride. it has to be gluconate. Because in other cases, you know, like so something IV that you need to give systemically, yeah. it probably doesn't matter here it absolutely absolutely matters. matters. Very, very painful. You're going to have to give good analgesia for this. Now, another thing that most of us aren't going to see in our practice, no. quite frankly, but we still, it is an emergency. We have to know about it. They love to test on it, is radiation injuries. And radiation injuries can be something that you're exposed externally to radiation or it's been ingested or inhaled. And remember that the systems in your body that are the most vulnerable to damage from radiation are the GI uh, t system and the hematology system. And the reason is because those tissues or those cells turn 
over a lot, and so they're very damaged by, by radiation. You can also see people confused and have CNS effects as well. Ugh, I don't like to think of radiation no, poisoning. It just, no, it's just like very no, no, no. awful to think of. But if you see someone with a burn that you're not sure what happened, and you know they've got some kind of something weird, I mean, there's poisonings that happen, right? There you are. These things Actually, in the we, news. Have a, we have a toxicology colleague who explains it from, you see, he had a patient come in with a, a really weird hand burn, kind of across there, really weird hand burn. It's like, what is that? And then had a really low white count. It's like, oh, weird hand burn, really low white count. How does that go together? Yeah. Turns out the guy was ske stealing cobalt. Oh my gosh. Yeah, had, yeah. had held cobalt and got a burn. It's no Great question. Pickup. <laughs> Thank God it was a toxicologist who That's saw him. I wouldn't have picked that up. No. Toxicologist got it no. cold. <laughs> <laughs> no, obviously, if you have a lethal radiation exposure, that is bad, and you, yeah. you know your GI system goes bananas, and you desquamate, and the whole thing. And the you know the earlier that they manifest with symptoms, the yeah. means the higher the dose was, and the worse the prognosis. Not good. Decontamination is huge. Just think of Silkwood if you're old enough to remember yeah. that movie. Where if not, just, watch it. It's good. It's a good movie, but you know she gets scrubbed and scrubbed and scrubbed from all the radiation exposure, and people have to be protected. That's why people wear you know in the Simpsons, you see all the people wearing all the stuff. <laughs> the, like the Simpsons because he works in a you know <laughs> or radiation or in yeah. Japan. Yeah. Yeah, we have exactly. a tsunami that yes. causes a meltdown of a yeah. nuclear power plant. So you want to get the clothing off and make sure that, again, these are if this contaminated with radiation, you'd be careful with it. And then you're going to wash things off and they have to go under the hair and the nails. And, you know, and then you internally try to decontaminate with charcoal. And maybe you do how about right. irrigation and chelation agents. And this is all like, oh, it's just kind of scary and terrorism kind of stuff. It I is kind of scary. So and the thing about this kind of decontamination is everything that's washed off. Yeah, even the water also is also contaminated. So that has to all get put somewhere. Yeah, yes, that's it's like true. flipping crazy. That's true. That's crazy. Yeah. So here's kind of a little summary looking, remember, reminding yourself of when are the onset of the symptoms depending on the system that's involved. If it's your hemopoietic system, you're going to start to see cell lines start dropping out, you know, pretty quickly and yeah. then prone to infections. And then the GI symptoms can happen in hours that yeah. they start to vomit and have GI bleeds. and then Which is a really bad sign. And then if they're like, they irradiated their brain, they can also, you know, have CNS damage and be confused. And ugh, I mean, like. If you really want to see like a terrified biologist watch the series Chernobyl. Yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. my word. Yeah. There we go. It's okay. awful. Mm -hmm. But the one thing at the bottom here is they like to ask the question about the lymphopenia and the absolute lymphocyte count because it's prognosis, it's, pr it's prognostic, and it is like a an evidence-based thing. So yeah. if you were to count, get, get their absolute lymph lymphocyte count after a radiation exposure and it's less than 300, they are prog their prognosis Yeah, within two days, bad. if that happens, they yeah. are, it's not good. Yeah. It's not good. Sad.